So I rewatched Sex and the City season 3 and I really didn't have to do it because this is my favorite SATC season. I've seen it a million times and at this point I know it by heart. At last we finally get Anthony, Aiden, Trey and the best side character ever, Bunny McDougall. This is the season where Carrie basically sabotages her own happiness, Charlotte realizes that life isn't a fairy tale, Miranda tries to become more vulnerable but fails and Samantha is the most non-judgmental friend one could ever have. As always, I'm not analyzing this season episode by episode, but rather by breaking down the main characters, their arcs, their fashion, etc. Which means there will be spoilers. Also, get ready for unhinged fashion TED Talks as season 3 serves some of the most iconic Sex and the City looks, like the Dior newspaper print dress and the Prada lipstick skirt, as well as the abundance of flower brooches and mostly authentic Fendi baguettes. So let's get into it. I know I usually start with Carrie, but you know what? Charlotte was giving nothing but breadcrumbs of storylines in the past two seasons and now it is finally her time to shine, so let her have her moment. Her character's arc starts already in the first episode, she's not wasting any time. The whole Staten Island episode is heavily fairy tale themed, with Carrie having her Cinderella moment, the White Knight rescue fantasy discussion, and Charlotte making a wish. But you know what I say? Be careful what you wish for. I'm getting married this year! From that moment onwards, Charlotte really becomes committed to finding her future husband and getting married. After a couple of bad dates with the guy with anger management issues, the bad kisser, Ew! the guy who insults women in order to achieve satisfaction, Charlotte finally meets her future husband Trey while being dressed in the iconic Prada skirt. Now then, two things. Number one, listen, I know, trust me, I know that Trey is Dolayev and he has the worst sense of humor ever, but he is played by the one and only Kyle MacLachlan and we stan Kyle MacLachlan in this household. Do you guys remember this meme from a couple years ago about Disney princesses being a reason for our unrealistic hair expectations? Well. Cal McLachlan, or should I say Special Agent Dale Cooper, because that's who he is to me, gave me unrealistic hair expectations when it comes to straight white men over 30. You'll understand when you're older. And the thing number two, the Prada skirt. If you've been following the media surrounding fashion on Sex and the City, I'm sure that you noticed that Charlotte's lipstick print skirt is usually considered one of the most memorable pieces of clothing from the entire show. But what those fashion writers fail to explain is precisely why this Prada Spring 2000 skirt is so amazing. After all, the length is pretty conservative and the print itself is quite peculiar. Now, I don't want to flex on you, I mean, maybe a little I do, but I do own an entire look from the same Prada collection and I would call myself a vintage Prada enthusiast. So, welcome to my fashion TED talk. Mucha Prada Spring 2000 collection paid homage to Yves Saint Laurent, hence the prints of lips, hearts and lipsticks, but it was also referencing the depiction of upper classes in films of Louis Buñuel and Michelangelo Antonioni. Both directors usually place their films in higher societies, aiming to expose the facade of the bourgeoisie, that below the glamorous surface lurks corruption, loneliness and superficial relationships without real emotional intimacy between romantic partners. Do you see what I'm going with it? Mucha Prada also said that behind her Spring 2000 collection stood the idea of quote, a lady who's not a lady, a lady who pretends to be proper. And we all know that Charlotte isn't such a goody-goody after all. Yes, uh, that's right, uh-huh. Don't stop, just like that. So, Having Charlotte wear the lipstick skirt in the scene when she meets Trey pretty much serves as a sad foreshadowing of their marriage. Exactly like the heroines of Buñuel and Antonioni, Charlotte leads a seemingly picture-perfect life. On the surface level, she has everything she ever dreamt about, a handsome husband who is a heart surgeon, a heart surgeon, you guys, who can mend her broken heart, oh, so perfect. She lives in this gorgeous apartment, 
basement filled with lavish china sets, dust ruffleless beds and whatnot. But deep inside she becomes incredibly lonely, stuck in a marriage with a guy who can't express his emotions and refuses to address his problems, which only leads Charlotte to become more and more sexually frustrated, pretty much like Catherine Deneuve's Severine in Louis Buñuel's 1967 film called Belle de Jour. Damn it, I just really want to be. In Patricia Field, we trust. We might not always agree with her styling choices, especially in her latest work, but you can tell me that this level of film and fashion knowledge isn't something worth admiring. My marriage is a fake Fendi. And that's pretty much what happens to Charlotte in season 3. She goes from being single to married for 3 months to finally separated in the last episode. Charlotte is seeing the gardener. Charlotte, you're a McDougal now. <laughs> oh my god. Bunny! Is this what you call tradition? Now, I know that it is tempting to mock Charlotte for her willingness to get married for the sake of being married, especially now that cohabitation and staying single forever is socially acceptable. But I can guarantee you that there are still many communities that value more traditional family structures and until this day many women experience immense pressure to get married and even in the SATC universe we had characters like Lexi Featherston who was supposed to serve as a cautionary tale to all the party girls out there you can be single and fabulous exclamation mark but only until a certain age past that all that is left for you is to settle down and if you don't I wouldn't necessarily call myself a certified Charlotte apologist, but I like that she learns from her mistakes, which allows her to grow as a person. And even in this season, there were a couple of moments when she was letting go of this rigid idea of the person that she was supposed to be. The most noticeable one was when Charlotte and Trey sat on the floor in Charlotte's apartment after they separated and they had what it felt to be their first honest conversation ever. It literally took them an entire season to finally openly talk about their emotions. And I really like that at this moment Charlotte didn't care if her hair is messy or what will her neighbors think about it, you know, like stupid things Charlotte cares about. Also, Charlotte dressed as a drag king, 10 out of 10. Okay, so here's the thing. 20 years ago, being a Carrie was aspirational, right? Celebrities wanted to be her, designers were dying to dress her. But now, I'm assuming, as a form of rejection of this worldwide obsession with her character, people became overly judgmental of her actions and personality. And listen, I don't say she doesn't deserve any criticism, but aren't we a little too harsh? Where is the middle ground? Because she is the way she is by the design. Sometimes she's relatable, other times she's a mess or annoying. And that's what makes her character feel like a human, because humans are complex. Let me use an example. At the beginning of season 3, Carrie finds out about Big and Natasha's wedding. This leads her to pondering about women who simply exist to make us feel bad about ourselves, which in Carrie's case, this woman of course is Natasha. But the thing is that Natasha was nothing but kind and sweet to Carrie. She never said anything mean to her, she never gave her a side eye or did anything to indicate that she secretly disliked her. If anything, I would assume that Natasha was the one to be petrified of the celebrity columnist her husband dated. But of course, we never see Natasha's perspective in all of this. You know, she's shiny hair, style section, Vera Wang, and I'm, you know, the sex column they run next to ads for penile implants. It is very tempting and easy to call out Carrie for acting really immature here, being deeply insecure and projecting her own insecurities on Natasha, which yes, she does. But at the same time, don't you just want to hug her and tell her bestie? 
start practicing self-love, go with Charlotte to those affirmation classes or something and don't let your own insecurities ruin your life. Really, the scene is so painful. Carrie basically realizes that Big wasn't, I don't know, like forced into this marriage, right? Like he chose Natasha, they have their own song. My god, the scene is so profoundly sad. Don't you want to just tear up? Just a little bit? And that's what I mean when I say Carrie is a complex character. She can be insufferable and relatable at the same time. Luckily, to Carrie's rescue appears Aiden, the perfect boyfriend archetype who hates smoking. And okay, after some ups and downs, Carrie finally quit smoking for him. But imagine how bad must have her apartment still smell like. Cigarette smell lingers in houses for years and years after quitting. And if I were such a smoke hater, I don't think I would want to hang out at Carrie's apartment as much as Aiden does. But okay. <laughs> anyway, Aiden is sweet, lovable, a handyman who can repair a sink if it's broken. That's a huge asset if you ask me. He's tall, loves dogs and introduces Carrie to his parents, unlike Mr. Big in season one. You make me really happy. Aiden really feels like a great guy. He's just not a guy for someone like Carrie who thrives on drama. Ultimately, this is why Carrie was so drawn to Mr. Big, because he just fed her with endless supplies of drama. Like, that must be it, because if you think about it, he is so not interesting as a character. All we know about him at this point is that he's this big fish in New York, goes to church with his mother, his ex-wife is a book editor, and he listens to old music. Also, his name is John. Okay, technically we don't know this yet, but come on. He's such not a John. He's not a romantic type, nor particularly generous. He doesn't have a great sense of humor, except for those rare scenes. It's usually one scene per season when he's hilariously funny. This season is a drunk bug. There is something about him saying beige, beige, everything in my house is beige. That is utterly funny for me. To which Carrie famously responds, I thought you wanted beige meaning Natasha is the beige vanilla simple girl from the way we were. After meeting Aiden and realizing that Carrie has moved on, Big starts to leave her voicemails, he randomly shows up at her apartment, until Carrie decides to sabotage her own life by starting an affair with him. I'm not gonna lie to you, I find this elevator scene very disturbing and the whole affair to be pretty raw. Because it's not like Carrie and Big go on romantic trips to Paris or something, you know, like, like they do in the movies. No, they just meet in those progressively cheaper hotels and they kind of mean to each other. It almost feels like a form of addiction. It was fun at first, but it's not anymore and they just don't know how to stop. Which I assume is a continuation of season 2 idea that Carrie is addicted to toxic relationships and she's a masochist for being with Mr. Big. And we all know what happens next. Natasha catches Carrie in her own apartment, falls from the stairs while chasing her, breaks her tooth and finally decides to divorce Big. After a couple of weeks, Carrie is still driven by guilty conscience and stalks Natasha to her lunch. Um, there is surprisingly a lot of stalking in this season, I noticed, but yeah, this is Carrie at her lowest, there is no excuses to her actions, not only she ruined Natasha's marriage, but she also ruined her lunch and had the audacity to drink Natasha's water. That's a no for me. But hey, at least she was dressed in the one and only Dior newspaper print dress, and you know what it means? The fashion TED talk number two. The whole season three of Sex and the City is basically an ad for John Galliano era Dior. No judgment here, just pure facts. Carrie happens to own the Dior saddlebag in pretty much every finish this bag was produced at the time. Personally, I never got the appeal of the Dior saddlebag, mostly because I would call myself a Dior Malice girly, which is another Galliano designed bag for Dior. My Dior girl. I'll get it. <laughs> Always imagine that if Carrie ever met real-life John Galliano, their conversation would be similar to the one she had with Carrie Fisher. I'm Carrie, you're Carrie. I write, you write. 
Carrie would be like, you love fashion, I love fashion, you're problematic, I'm problematic, let me wear your designs because we're a match made in heaven. Because so it happens that John Galliano came up with this print idea after noticing unhoused Parisians using newspapers to protect themselves from freezing. But wait, there is more! Galliano was also inspired by the 1920s and 30s trombobles where wealthy Parisians dressed up as peasants, um, basically for fun? If I were him, I would just say I'm referencing Elsa Schiaparelli or this 1866 screen-printed ball gown, but okay. Sarah Jessica Parker looks incredible in this dress, the whole collection was really successful and until this day it is one of the most known Dior collections ever. But back to this scene. After endless internet searches, I still can't find who designed Natasha's pink dress. It actually looks so different from anything she wore on the show, not just because of the color, but the fabric and the overall retro feel. And then it got me thinking, what if she's wearing a Dior dress too, but it's vintage Dior? Huh? After all, Carrie and Natasha are each other opposites, yet they fell from the same guy. Similarly, Christian Dior and Jungaliano had totally different styles, dressed totally different women, yet they both created under the same label. Is this an overinterpretation? Um, yes. Yes, it is, but I'm gonna run with it regardless. In season 3, Samantha is a national treasure and should be protected at all costs. She's our trisexual queen. I'm a trisexual. I'll try anything once. A proud bisexual ally. She has that brilliant HIV test scene. And she's a non-judgmental and supportive friend. What an icon. Don't you want to judge me just a little bit? No, my style. Since Samantha wasn't giving a love interest and in season 4 she literally gets two, I've been thinking about her relationship with Charlotte. Shout out to you Vesti for suggesting this topic. And honestly, after watching this season, I started to understand those wild conspiracy theories about Miranda, Samantha and Charlotte being just different parts of Carrie's psyche, or that Carrie as a writer invented them for the sake of her column. Look, I understand that Samantha and Charlotte don't really have that much in common, or at least until now in the show they don't, and that's why they rarely hang out together, it's usually Carrie who unites the group, that's, that's fine. Plus, Sex and the City often pits the characters against each other, like in season 4 it's Charlotte and Miranda. Charlotte has a baby fever, but she's infertile. Miranda, on the other hand, accidentally gets pregnant and considers terminating her pregnancy. Likewise, in season 3, we get the conflict between Samantha and Charlotte and their different views on sex. And it does sound like a good idea, and in some scenes it works. This, this was a very cute moment. But for me, the psychology just isn't there. What's in this friendship for Samantha? Why she puts up with Charlotte's continuous slut-shaming, dramatically leaving their branches, and basically her pure disgust of Samantha's lifestyle? And I don't understand why Samantha forgives her so quickly. They had this massive fight before Charlotte's wedding in this bridal salon. Charlotte said some awful, awful things. She once again slut-shamed Samantha and revealed that she only invited Samantha to her wedding so that she didn't feel left out and the next scene is Charlotte's wedding and they are all good like what I know that one does not watch sex and the city for realism but this fight scene could be the least realistic thing in the entire show not Carrie's excessive shoe collection nor her apartment but the fact that this fight didn't end their friend group As much as I love Miranda and Steve, their chemistry and relationship, this season I felt like 
we, we've seen enough of Steve. In season 2, he was so charming and lovable, but in season 3, he was giving me some serious Nate from The Devil Wears Prada vibes. You know, like a whiny boyfriend who acts all childish and vilifies his girlfriend for thriving in her career. Miranda was working so hard to get a promotion at her work and he was like, oh, let's get a puppy, let's have a baby, watch me play basketball, Steve, grow up. Especially since Miranda really tried to open up and be more vulnerable with him. I really loved their fight scene at the beginning of season when Steve wanted to move in with Miranda, which of course absolutely terrified her. Whenever I think about Miranda, the word control comes to mind. You know, she's a corporate lawyer, her life is all about facts and figures, she's pragmatic, direct and very analytical. So the idea of showing someone that sometimes she can't control everything, that her life gets messy too. So basically revealing her true self to somebody sounds like a really tough thing for her to do. Steve, I really tried. Single Miranda honestly deserves her own show. Her struggles were so real. As someone who has always been the cute one, not the sexy one, I found myself relating to her in her goddess workouts or pretending to be a stewardess for a day and the overall quest of becoming a sexy Miranda. <laughs> she was just so relatable this season. I'm on Valium, everything's okay. No matter if she had a hangover straight from a horror movie or when she felt invisible to potential mates, I don't think I speak only for myself when I say, been there, done that. <laughs> so, what's it like to uh, kiss somebody with those things? Even Miranda with braces felt real and weirdly triggering too because that was a question I heard a lot as a teenager with braces back in 2006. Ew. You bought a back pillow? Yeah, and I'm getting old.com. On the whole, season 3 is one of the strongest Sex and the City seasons. It has so many memorable lines, scenes, and fashion moments, but it's also a very paradoxical season. It is dated, yet it will never get old and it only gets better with each rewatch. In my opinion, it is extremely important to call out SATC for its problematic storylines, but we shouldn't simultaneously lose the early 2000s perspective. It might not feel that long ago, but watching Carrie freely smoke indoors and learn about the so-called Brazilian way Wax, um, feels like a completely different world. Back then, storylines like Miranda getting an STD or Samantha taking an HIV test were shocking. Stuff like this was rarely, if ever, shown on TV. And it wasn't just for giggles like Charlotte getting crabs in season 2. No, those were emotional and gripping arcs. Samantha literally passed out because of anxiety surrounding the test, and Miranda needed to contact all her past sexual partners as well as have a sincere conversation with Steve. That sounds like hell. I also read somewhere that in the early 2000s, Sex and the City was one of few TV shows to use certain vulgar words, which only goes to show how prudish television was at the time. And SATC continues to shock even today, just a little bit differently. In 2023, watching Carrie being absolutely crossed out and repulsed by the idea of dating a bisexual guy is shocking. Same with the episode where Samantha dated a black guy and the show's foray into racial commentary. Aged like milk. Yet in season 3, there are many universal storylines like love, affair and friendship that will always stay relevant. I really liked how this season further explored Carrie's friendship with each of the girls. Charlotte was so sweet to stay with Carrie and read together that wedding article because she knew how emotionally difficult this will be. Samantha was nothing but supportive of Carrie this entire season and Miranda... Well, I don't know if we should all be Mirandas, but we definitely should have a Miranda in our lives. But most importantly, this season is my warm blanket. It never fails to make me laugh. I absolutely lose it when Miranda pretends to be a flight attendant or Samantha's funky spunk guy. <laughs> Gets me every time. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.